Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Before Play for Little Red Warrior and His Lawyer, written by Kevin Loring, Governor General's award-winning playwright. Uh, we're coming to you virtually this morning from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people. On behalf of everyone of the Belfry, I thank the Songhees and Esquimalt nations for the privilege of living and creating on this land, which they've cared for for centuries and which represents their language, their culture, and their identity. Uh, so this, uh, this production of Little Red Warrior was uh, meant to open our, our 2020 uh, 2021 season, the season that never actually happened. And so uh, it's our great good fortune that um, everyone that we had cast and all the designers that we had engaged were all able to come back. And so here we are a year and a half later uh, and the cast and designers are getting ready for our first preview on Tuesday. And then we open the show on Thursday. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who came to Before Play in person for Serving Elizabeth and everyone who attended uh, Serving Elizabeth both in person and virtually. Uh, it, was, um, it was extraordinary to welcome people back to the theater and also those, those of you who attended the, uh, the live streamed performances. It was uh, just fantastic how, how eager everyone was to get back to the theater. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to the theater with Little Red Warrior. Uh, as you know, uh, Before Play is a collaboration between CBC Radio and The Belfry. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome Gregor Craigie, our fantastic host of Before Play. Oh, and I should just mention that uh, Dr. Sasha Kovacs, who was intended to be one of our guests this morning, uh, had a family emergency back in Ontario and had to uh, withdraw at the last moment. But we have three fantastic guests and I'm sure we'll get Sasha back at another time. So I'll hand things over to you, Gregor. Thank you. Oops. You'd think two years into this thing, I would have figured out the mute button. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, it's a shame we can't be uh, together in person, but we will be again soon. And, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us again online and uh, good to have you with us for another before play our first of three guests this morning is the playwright and director kevin loring who's an accomplished canadian playwright actor and director he won the governor general's award for his play where the blood mixes which explores the intergenerational effects of the residential school system and was seen at the belfry in 2010. kevin loring is from the Lytton first nation and has served as the co-curator of the talking stick festival and as artist in residence at the Vancouver Playhouse. He is the artistic director of both Savage Society in Vancouver and the Indigenous Theatre Company at the National Arts Centre. Kevin is both writer and director, as I mentioned, of Little Red Warrior and his lawyer. Kevin, thanks for joining us on, on Before Play. Thanks for taking time out for this. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honour to be here. Can you tell us, first of all, what drew you to the theater as a profession and, and tell us a bit about your career journey? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I went to university in Kamloops at what was then the University College of the Caribou and uh, I sort of floundered around trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I landed in a uh, can lit class that happened to have Thompson Highway as part of the syllabus. And so I read uh, Dry Lips Ought to Move to Capus Casing mm -hmm. by Thompson Highway. And I was, I was, I had to, I had to present a monologue, in fact, in front of my class. It's the first time I'd ever had to memorize a monologue and stand in front of people and deliver it. And I went through like, it was like the process of being in a mini play. Like I had to memorize my lines. I had to get it in front of the class and I had like opening night nerves and everything. But uh, I, I stood up in front of everybody and I, dropped into character and for two minutes I was Big Joey and at the end of it uh, the class my audience applauded and I was hooked <laughs> <laughs> that was it you don't yeah. still remember any of that monologue do you and I'm not I'm no 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 spot. I'm just no. curious what what sticks and what doesn't but. Uh, I just remember uh, the play itself. I was like, even though it was, it's a Cree play, it's set in a, in a, in a community that's, that's far removed from my hometown and my community in Lytton, British Columbia, but I recognized those characters. And, and mm -hmm. it was the, it was the, the real visceral first encounter with indigenous drama. And uh, I just, I, 
I saw my reality reflected in those words and uh, it just, uh, it just connected me in a really powerful way. And, and did that experience, Kevin, also set you on that kind of double path, if I can call it that, of both, uh, uh, you know, playwriting and directing? I mean, you weren't, you weren't thinking ju just, well, I don't, I shouldn't say just, but you weren't thinking of simply one, uh, one track in, in the theater. No, I never thought about being a player. I mean, I always wrote. So I, I always, uh, as a teenager, I was one of those kids that was always writing short stories and poetry and writing songs, uh, you know, playing like little songs, little three, three and four chord songs on my guitar and making, you know. Uh, so I was always sort of creative in that, in that way. And then when I went to theater school, um, when I went to go pursue theater professionally in a real uh, dedicated focus way. I went to Studio 58 at Langara College in Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, which is an amazing theater program. Uh, and, and it was really tough, but uh, they had a, uh, a playwriting class as part of it. And part of your journey through their, that school is you have to create, write and, and produce your own solo show. Oh. And so uh, in that process of, being, of training to be an actor, I learned an affinity and a, a sort of knack for, for writing plays as well. How different are the roles, you know, the, the, the playwriting versus uh, directing? Uh, I, well, directing, acting, and playwriting, they're all, they're the, they're all d deeply connected, obviously, right? And, and so um, I find I didn't get into directing until much later in my career, just for, for fairly recently. Like I, I was, uh, when I came out of theater school, I was writing plays and auditioning and working as an actor. Um, and it wasn't until later on where I began to direct my own work uh, as part of uh, through my company Savage Society, especially a community project that I do back uh, back in my hometown over the last 10 years. Um, and it, it sort of evolves out of that relationship between understanding the work of a playwright, understanding the process of an actor, and then you put the other part of the triangle in there. The work of a director is is to translate those words into action on the stage and to work in collaboration with all of the artists in the room and you know over the two decades of my career i've, I've learned uh how that works you know and, and it feels like it feels for me it feels very natural to go between the, the th those three roles yeah what about uh, the, this play itself without giving away any spoilers can you give us a, a brief description of the the play and and give us a sense of of what inspired you to write it well, what inspired me to write it was uh, I was doing some work before I was a professional artist uh, in one of the First Nations back home. Uh, there was a, a particular piece of uh, a, a watershed above the above the Cisco First Nation called the Cisco Watershed, where I was hired by the First Nation to go in with a team of um, forestry surveyors because they were there was a logging company had rights to log the, the valley. And the First Nation wanted an observer to go along to make sure that uh, to document where they were going to make the cut blocks and and to to try to get some evidence of traditional use by the Tlacapoc people from the Cisco First Nation. And so on that two and a half week work trip, I documented clear signs of traditional use. And then uh, that summer I flew into the same valley with a, a group of archeologists and we mapped it all out where it was at. And we got that evidence to the First Nation. And at the time I was thinking, well, I'm here to save the valley, right? Like my, I am here as uh, in my role for the First Nation to help you know, protect this watershed. Mm. And in the end, what it really was, was that it allowed the First Nation to have those bargaining chips and that leverage at the bargaining table about how and who was going to log that valley. Ah. And so they were able to, to have more leverage in their negotiations about how that, that those resources were going to be um, exploited. And I was kind of shocked by that. I thought that you know, I was there to to be a land defender and to protect the valley but really it, it it is as much i think in the end i was like well that's it gives the first nation access to that territory that is not easily accessible it's you know you'd have to get in there through horseback or following like an old horse trail we were flown in by helicopter to get up in there but oh, wow. they because they were logging it they drove you know they cut logging roads in there and made cut blocks and that gave access to blueberries and uh. all of the resources in the valley that the first nation um, prizes and they had leverage from the negotiating table to be able to, to benefit from the proceeds of that uh, extraction maybe it's an obvious question kevin but how important is it for you as a playwright to have uh, some of your work guided by real life experience like that and in a way it's an obvious question but you know i mean this comes out of 
real work, real uh, interaction, real living for you, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I think as writers, you you write based off of things that you've experienced or, or know, you know, write what you know, as the old adage says. But uh, I mean, if when you see this play, this play is very far removed from any kind of realistic, uh, you know, it's not, you know, he, Little Red is the last remaining, last remaining member of uh, the Little Red First Nation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fable, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you think of another Little Red, it's like Little Red Riding Hood in a way, right? And so yes. Little Red Warrior and his lawyer, it's this, yeah. it's this sort of fantastical, really uh, out there kind of gonzo farce about uh, the land claims issue. It's, but it is rooted in a lot of, um, you know, relationality of First Nations and like the crown, for example. But it, at, at it is in no way a realistic extrapolation, right? Like yeah. we're sort of taking it and then blowing it up uh, and then sort of hijinks ensue kind of show. Okay, that's right. Because comedy is, is, a, is a big uh, factor here and the trickster is, is an important role. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, in, in Tlacatma culture, uh, the coyote, uh, and there's several aspects of the coyote, but uh, in Chinkayap, as I always say in Tlacatma uh he's a trickster transformer character and sort of the the anti-hero of a lot of our creation stories and so what I wanted to do was explore this idea of uh this land claims issue and, and a bunch of other issues um through this sort of lens of a trickster universe where sort of everything is pretty fantastical and kind of up for grabs and nobody is really good you know um uh -huh. they have all sort of they're all all of the characters in this play have are kind of transformer tricksters and uh it, with different aspects but uh it's sort of through that lens yeah what about the comedy uh, though i wonder why i mean and maybe it just comes naturally to you but i wonder why you think it can be an effective way to address some pretty serious issues that, that you can blend both yeah i i um i think that uh dealing with issues uh, 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 a pretty powerful response way to respond to it is through humor um you know in and where the blood mixes it's it's a really heavy play but there is a lot of humor in it as well and and uh that is to sort of help the audience breathe in the places where they get pulled under the you know deep down into the into the currents of the play you need the humor to allow them up for the light and to mm -hmm. breathe and in this play I, I it's it really is a comedy and it is really it, it's dealing with some heavy issues and some heavy and serious uh histories in terms of indigenous and uh settler crown relations and uh but it is meant to be uh in this particular piece it uh the, the humor is sort of targeted in a way that it walks a very fine line um and I, i'm kind of going for that that feeling of it's like i want people to laugh but i want them to be uncomfortable about their uh, laughter as well. so okay so that's that thin edge you're and talking sort of about the, the dance back and forth in that yeah there's a little bit of edge in this show yeah <laughs> okay well that's making me want to see it more <laughs> What, yeah. what about what about uh, indigenous theater and and the the recent resurgence, if I can call it that, of of Canadian uh, uh, indigenous theater? Uh, any personal reflections on on the themes of that overall, and and what you've witnessed in your in your two decades taking part? Yeah, and you know that we we stand on the backs of giants. There's a lot of trailblazers that have come before us, who have uh, laid down the track for us to sort of uh, launch our own careers, and uh, you know with since the TRC um, and the calls to action, a lot of our major institutions have, have uh, you know, begin to reevaluate their relationship to indigenous artists. And so you see at the Canada Council, there's a separate stream uh, creating, knowing and sharing. Uh, the National Arts Centre has the Indigenous Theatre Department. Um, and these are responses to that, those calls to action um, to be more responsive and available and uh, uh, have, resources that Indigenous artists can access and, and platforms that Indigenous artists can access in a way that we've never had before. And so uh, we're seeing that also culturally with uh, a lot of the movements that have happened over the last several years, that there is a greater awareness to Indigenous issues and to Indigenous realities in this country. And I think that uh, the artists have always been there. There's more artists now than there are Indigenous artists than there have ever been. Um, and they're way more visible now than than they have been previously and i think that is for sure a direct response to uh, the work of the trc and, and if you're paying respect to those giants of, of the past 
What about the the indigenous artists of the future and, and creators of the future? I wonder how often you get asked for advice from young, young, young up and coming artists starting their career in a theater and, and what you tell them. Well, on this show, we have, uh, I, I have an assistant director who's an up and coming artist who we've been fostering her career, uh, Ty Amy Grumman. Uh, we have Kelsey Wavy, who's uh, also another artist whose who's work we've been, uh, through the, my work with Savage Society, we've been mentoring and, and fostering their work as well. And she's a, a costume assist on this. Um, and so uh, we are, you know, we have a, a real eye on mentorship and 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 supporting the work of, of young artists coming up um as i said earlier there's never been more resources it doesn't mean it's any you know it's any easier it's uh it is still a difficult business to be in but uh i think that artists with a clear vision and a clear voice um they are seeing companies from across the country interested in their work and i think that uh pursuing pursuing those visions has uh you know is super important we need we need those voices and there are many people out there that are that are really hungry to hear those voices so so what do you hope uh, audiences take away from little red warrior and and his lawyer well i think i hope that they uh i hope they come away and they they have a hard time uh not thinking about the play <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I hope yeah. that, that I hope that it rattles around in their head for a while, and I hope that they uh, uh, come away having been challenged in some ways, and also having had a you know had a bunch of big belly laughs. But I hope they also come away with um, thinking about their relationship to Indigenous uh, issues and people, and the history of uh, this colonial construct we call Canada and Indigenous people. Evan, I know it's a busy weekend. Thanks for taking the time for us uh, this morning to take part in Before Play. Thanks, John. Thank you for having me. Kevin Loring is uh, our first guest at Before Play this week. Our next guest is Susan Smitten, the executive director of Raven Trust, uh, the co-founder and executive director of Raven Trust, which is the only not-for-profit charity in Canada with a mission to raise legal defense funds to assist First Nations to enforce their rights to protect their traditional territories and the environment. An award-winning filmmaker whose past projects communicate the connection between environmental issues and First Nations stewardship of the land. Susan began her career in journalism, focusing on both storytelling and the desire to amplify the voices and issues of marginalized uh, groups. Susan, good morning. Welcome to Before Play. Good morning. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you with us. I, I mentioned a bit about uh, your background, but can you tell us more, your, your personal and professional background? What, what led you here? Sure. Uh, well, I'm so uh, I she, her pronouns. I'm a second generation settler from mixed European ancestry. I started out in, I was born in the Dish with One Spoon Treaty territory, but worked my way across the country. And now I'm very delighted and grateful to be living and working and playing here in the territory of Lekwungen speaking peoples. Uh, and yes, I am a recovering journalist, <laughs> <laughs> former cbc -er, yeah. and uh, and documentary filmmaker. Um, and 13 years ago, April 1st, an inauspicious day to start a charity, I was, I walked in and started setting up Raven, which uh, was uh, not something I saw coming, but it's, uh, it's uh, aligned because it's about storytelling and it's about finding a way to get people to listen to issues that they might not otherwise know about and then mobilize them to act, uh, whether it's to uh, participate by donating or just participate, you know, by sharing the news. So that's, that's where I've come from. And so we, what was the impetus behind founding Raven Trust? And can you tell us a bit more about its mission overall? Yeah, uh, well, the impetus was about access to justice, really, you know, I mean, that's, it's quite simple. And, and we have a very tight niche for the, as, as you said, you know, we're the only ones that do this in Canada. But um, it's, it's based on the fact that um, Indigenous peoples have some of the strongest rights in terms of being able to protect the environment because of their rights being enshrined in the constitution. So if those rights are being infringed, it's unconstitutional. But it's one thing to have a right, and then it's another thing to be able to enforce it. 
So when you have to go up against the deep pockets of government, which is how it works in Canada, federal and provincial, that's not level, the playing ground. That's very imbalanced. And so without means, nations couldn't see court challenges all the way through. You know, uh, we've been supporting Beaver Lake Cree Nation for all, the, almost, the, that was one of our first <laughs> programs that we've been helping with. And Chief Jermaine Anderson said, you know, it's not right that uh, as a nation, they have to choose between protecting the traditional mm. lands that have sustained the people for millennia or paying for the water truck that the people need to have drinking water. Like that's not a reasonable choice. So Raven has stepped into that gap as a bridging organization to basically help mobilize uh, money and redirect money to support indigenous nations that choose to go to, through the courts in order for redress. We talk uh, a bit about, you hear, uh, I think, increasing use of the term environmental racism. How does it come into play here? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, environmental racism was a, coin, a term coined like in 1982 uh, in the States, but it's, it's alive and well and breathing here. Uh, it's, in fact, I was just on a webinar and Chief Roland Wilson of West Moberly First Nations was speaking about this exact thing, saying, you know, the people need to understand that they can't eat their fish, the fish that sustained their nation for millennia because they're poisoned with mercury from the Site C Dam industrial project, which has destroyed their valley, is putting their treaty rights underwater, but it's a, it's a clear example of environmental racism. There was no consideration of Westmore really Nation, First Nations interests while uh, BC Hydro set about extracting what they need. And, and Chief Roland said, you know, it's like walking, it's like they, they walk into your home, they start moving out the furniture and rearranging the pictures on the wall without even so much as a handshake or saying hello, and you feel like you're being pushed out of your home. Um, so across Canada, right, toxic dumps, polluting projects, risky pipelines, tainted drinking water, they all disproportionately hurt Indigenous, Black and racialized communities. And these same communities are also, you know, just for the record, they're more likely to feel the impacts of climate change sooner than predominantly white communities. So these, this comes about essentially because of the discriminatory policies and actions that are a result of colonization. So how do you think storytelling can play a role here in, in both engaging and educating the public about indigenous land claims and the environment and that environmental racism you just described? Well, on, on a lot of ways, like I was thinking, Kevin's right, you know, humor is, uh, is storytelling like, is so important because um, on a really practical level for uh, storytelling and oral history is actually now being used in the courts to prove mm -hmm. title, prove ownership, prove occupation of the land. Like, that's how the Tilco team proved and were awarded title over their territory with stories um, that elder after elder after elder stood up in court and on a blank piece of plastic, they mapped out how they used the land and how that knowledge was passed down from generation to generation. And it, uh, that stood, you know, those stories not only stand the test of time, they, they um, are the fact finding that allow these decisions to be made. But, you know, on another level, um, like we're, we're developing a, an educational program that we're calling Home on Native Land. And we're working with uh, Ryan McMahon, um, Anishinaabe mm -hmm. stand-up comedian, and with humor, I mean, <laughs> you know, Sam, I'm sure knows him, and Kevin, but uh, we're tackling topics like doctrine of discovery, like, oh my God, what could be drier than, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and how do you, is that funny? I don't know, but, you know, when you hear Jeff Corntassel talk to Ryan McMahon, and they, there's, it, it's exactly what Kevin was saying, you know, you, you laugh, and then you go, oh, <laughs> oh man, that's hard. Uh, but it allows a space. It creates stories. Can create that space where uh, we can find empathy. You know, something I learned, and as a documentary filmmaker and as a storyteller too, is that we don't often change our ways intellectually. It, we have we change our ways through the heart, right, uh, and empathically. Yeah. And so if if stories can actually help us connect 
to what's important, then we can think about it after and, and then change how we act. And so I think that's how storytelling can, you know, contribute to movements. And, and, and Indigenous people have some, like I said, some of these strongest environmental rights, but um, we can build movements and supporting that access to justice by building movements, by telling these stories is ways for folks, you know, who are wanting to get involved in movements like decolonization and BIPOC allyship to take tangible action, you know, in their community that will have a positive impact on indigenous nations who are really standing up for all of us. And on the broader uh, scope of things, when you look at it, Susan, I wonder what are some of the, the, the key considerations when working with uh, both the current uh, colonial justice system, but also the indigenous ways of governance? You mentioned how that's starting to change, how, how a First Nations oral history can come into it. H how further do you think that might work? I wonder how the process might move forward in the years ahead, do you think? Well, uh, okay, so I'm just going to reiterate, like, I'm not a lawyer. Yes. Uh, but um, what we see uh, from Raven's position as a niche, you know, uh, fundraising to level the play playing field, I guess, um, is that the courts are ruling in favor of nations in, when it comes to land issues, um, but they have to be able to get there, right? Um, so I think, um, like for example, Beaver Lake Cree Nation is going to trial in 2024 on a, on a huge uh, issue to basically stop the expansion of the tar sands, mm -hmm. right? They've been trying for years. They had to work through um, a motion to strike and then an appeal and all of these things, but they're getting there. So I think what's happening is that precedent is going to get built upon precedent. And um, I think that's sort of how we're going to have to it takes a long time in the courts. That's one thing I would say. It takes a long time yeah. to be patient, but it is changing. And another thing that's really exciting is here, you know, here in UVic, we've got the very first um, JID program, right? Yes. The, that John Boros and Val Napoleon started the Joint Indigenous Aboriginal Law Program. Yeah. So we're going to have graduates. We have graduates coming out of that program who are going to have the blended uh, systems of indigenous laws and, and colonial law, uh, Canadian court law, um, that they will be bringing forward into courtrooms. And eventually those lawyers will also be on the bench mm -hmm. making judgments. And I think that's going to be something, I mean, we have to, it will, things will change and they are changing. So in the meantime, then, Susan, what would you say to people, whether they're watching this right now or, or they come away from seeing this play and, are, and are, are feeling like they might like to do something financially to help? What's, what's your message to members who might want to contribute to the, the legal defense efforts and rights of Indigenous people to, to protect their traditional territories? Right. Well, feels a little bit like a gimme, but I'm going to say, I mean, <laughs> you know, Raven uh, is a charity. I mean, they certainly... We would love that if they wanted to donate to some of the campaigns that we're supporting. Um, that's one way. Um, like uh, we've been supporting nations across the country, Nishtantika in Ontario, um, Beaver Lake Cree Nation, Wet'suwet'en, uh, Kekatla. We we supported three nations in Peel uh, that ended up protecting 84% of the Peel watershed. We're very excited about that. Um, you know, uh, I would encourage people to learn more to attend plays like this, to uh, actually uh, engage, you know, learn more about the community that they live in, uh, become um, contributing members uh, to the movement in whatever way that they feel they can. Take courses, right? Take the uh, Indigenous Canada course through Coursera or our Home on Native Land, which will be launching in March, but you know, there are so many ways like, and, and if people want to know, we have some resources on the Raven website, it's um, raventrust.com. So we have a lot of resources for people. We actually have a map that maps all of the legal precedents and gives some history so that people can actually understand how the law is moving. So I just put those things, those are some ideas. 
Well, I appreciate them and I appreciate you joining us. Uh, Susan, thanks for, for taking the time for Before Play this morning. It's a delight and uh, congratulations to Kevin and the Belfry and I'm super, and Sam, and I'm super excited to, to uh, see this play come to life. That's Susan Smitten with Raven Trust. And our, our final guest, uh, you just heard ref uh, referred to as Sam Bob, a Vancouver-based actor who has performed in TV, film, radio, and theater. His family is from the Nanus Indian Reservation on the island. His mother is from the Lyaxan First Nation, and his father is from the Snanamus uh, First Nation, Snanaus. He's performed on stages from coast to coast, was nominated for Vancouver's Jesse Award for Best Actor in his performance in Out of the Silence, and had the honor of working with Sir Anthony Hopkins in the film Blackway. Uh, Sam Bob plays Little Red in Little Red Warrior and his lawyer. Sam, good morning. Thanks for taking the good time morning. for us this morning. Yeah, well, thank you. Before we talk about this play, can you tell us a bit more about your own background? What, what first drew you to be an actor uh, as a profession and, uh, and get into this line of work? Well, I, uh, I went, did a summer program, a summer acting program, and got the bug. And they follow, I did a follow-up 10-month program and then kind of been, you know, just got, got into it, kind of fell into it. I went to a small theater school called Spirit Song. It's no longer there. It's, it's a First Nations uh, it was training. It was a First Nations training program. Uh, Evan, Ad, Doctor Evan Adams went through, and uh, filmmaker and writer uh, Marie Humber Clements went through there, and so several other notable people have, you know, have uh, came through that pro program. So it was um, it was really quite. Uh, it was it was like a real a real uh, starter for me to to be there, to and uh, to learn to learn the profession. And what about the different mediums, Sam? I mean, can you talk to us a bit about the difference between working uh, on stage, but, but versus TV and film, and 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 what do you oh. like most about each medium? Oh, it's um, they they each have their own uh, their own benefits and drawbacks. You know, like. Uh, you um you could reach a lot you can reach a lot of audience with tv and film you can you have a wide wider wider audience but there's something about the intimacy of the stage sharing the same room sharing the same space sharing the same moments and it's a it's a more uh visceral organic uh uh, uh communication and and with uh, tv and film you you're you're more omnipotent you know you're kind of you you kind of become part of a storyboard into the making of a larger a larger phenomenon, you know. With uh, with uh, what's uh, you know, it's an endless you know. Yeah, possibilities are endless with uh, with TV and film. How you how you shoot it, what you, you know, what you know, what, what the story. But the commonality is is a good story. You mm -hmm. need that. You need to have that good story to in order to make it effective. Has the pandemic uh, made you appreciate any of those more, you know, whether it's being on stage uh, as a theater actor or, or what have you? I wonder how much it's changed your perspective as an actor overall. Uh, I was actually one of the early victims of the pandemic. No. I was in a coma for nine days. And oh no. I almost passed away. The doctors called in the, uh, called in, they, they called in the iPad thing to for my family to come in. Wow! Basically to say their farewells, you know, on the eighth day and um, on the ninth day something clicked in and I I pulled out my intubation, pulled out my tubes, and um, and they they can't put your intubation back in once you pulled it out. So I was on my own. So sink or swim, and I survived. So wow! Well, I'm uh, glad to hear it. Yeah, I know. I know. So I am actually, I, I, uh, from that, you realize how, uh, from a hospital, uh, from a recovery ward, you realize the world still goes, this world still goes around you. The world still happens. You know, I looked out at my window, you could see the Davy street traffic, and people getting coffee and living their lives. Then you realize that, you know, oh, how, how valuable, you know, the as simple things are in life, you know, like mm -hmm. being grumpy at rush hour traffic or <laughs> being in, 
being grumpy in, in the back of a long line at the grocery store, you know, those are just wonderful things that you, you appreciate that you, you just like, wow, I miss that. I miss this. I miss that. I miss everything. I don't care if it's a long line at, you know, whatever at the bank. It's just, it'll just happen. It's because that's part of living, part yeah. of being in the world. Okay. And so if that gave you a renewed impression or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, appreciation for traffic yeah. or getting stuck in a line, what must your appreciation <laughs> be like for getting back on stage and make and entertaining people? And making oh them my laugh? God. I know. I know. It's like, it's a gift really. It is really a gift to be able to be able to, to join and share these in these circles, these talented people, you know, these, you know, they're just, they're phenomenal talented people all around you know crew cast writer director every you know it's just um it's it's what i want to do it's what i wanted to do and it's like i'm this is my first play back so and it's just it's great i just love it so much well congratulations wow to to come back <laughs> from that can, can you <laughs> yeah. tell us a bit more about your own background? Your traditional name is Tulkwimult, and and I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, uh, correctly. It's pretty can close, you, yeah. It's pretty, pretty pretty good. Can you set yeah. me straight on it? Tulkwimult. Tulkwimult. Yeah, yeah. That's it's my grandfather's name on on my mother's side, and uh, and I was raised in the Longhouse tradition of uh, uh, Southern Vancouver Island, Fraser Valley. And, uh, and Northern Washington State, and it's so the, these uh, the name naming system is goes by uh, there's they're like an ancient an ancient uh, family you know family lists of names and that you choose from and it's all and it's all done in in the longhouse and yeah I was raised by my grandparents when I was very young so I got a lot of traditional teachings there and I learned a lot and watching the orators of the longhouse and the the uh, customs and the ceremony it was like the um it was like very pristine theater you know like you, the creation of because you're creating from identity from spiritual spirituality and and it's just it was just i just yeah i was uh, really blessed to be to have that you know, with my grandmother, my grandmother took care of me, and and, and uh, the medicine of us. I think I think that's what I, I love. I really appreciate that I carry that, and want to share that with my children. It sounds like that's really stuck with you. Hey, the medicine of the long. Oh yeah. Oh, did that help you yeah, in hospitals, yeah. uh, Sam? When you were, when you were in there with COVID? Pardon me. Did that help you in the hospital too? Oh yeah. I, um, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think that um, that uh, for for me, uh, part of it is the med uh, part of me. Part of it, me in me being an artist, is sharing the medicines. And one of those medicines, I think, is very important is for grandmothers, you know, to their grandchildren. It's really, it's really, it is. It's a real thing. And the way my grandmother, uh, she, the way she. Um, she nurtured me with our medicines. And I really feel that, you know, that's part of me wanting to be here is to be that reminder for our young, our young, our young people is that it's, the, it's your turn. You nurture your um, children and your grandchildren. And you make, you know, you, you tend, you tend to their spiritual development too, not just, not just, you know, not the, not just the physical, you know, things of life. There's more important. There's very important things inside that need to be, and part of that is it's it's a it's a medicine for healing, for you know, and laughter is a good one too. That's what that's what I like to do with theater. So how does this play fit into that? What what do you think about the role of laughter in this? Uh, to talk about some serious issues too. Yeah, well. Um, I, I guess comedy for me, it's like, um, yeah, it, it's kind of, it's 
like they say, laughter is the best medicine. And I think sometimes when you uh, when you deconstruct ideas and and, and uh, concepts, and you make it in turn it, you said you know turn it into something a little more, um, and you know sim in a simple way. What how do you how do you see like um, uh, Susan was talking about, you know. Um, uh, 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 what did she say? She said courses. What did she say? Still do courses or something? Yeah, you but can I do a number. Her, I, yeah. I, I heard, what I heard her say was steal horses, and I was like, oh. yeah, <laughs> steal horses. That's that's we'll take courses. We'll take, yeah, she said take courses. I was yeah. like, yeah, we'll take we'll take horses and we'll just make a stand and we'll take horses. That's common. It's like, you take a moment, it's like, you know, you turn it around, right? Take horses. And it's just, it's just stupid. It's like silly and humorous and people and wanting to make people laugh and want people, I wanted people to, to let down the guard, be disarmed and just enjoy themselves and, and to be able to, and sure, no matter what color or what culture or what class or whatever, you know, what what gender, you know, all of that. Like there's this, uh, I think that in uh, a lot of ways, people are keep, people have become people could become guarded, you know, like you know, protecting their position, whatever it is. Just like uh, road rage is like that, you know, the ultimate ex expression of that. So yeah, that's right. I got yeah. my place in line. Don't you dare get in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. And that, then, it, <laughs> then they extrapolate that onto other things. And, you know, and it's really silly because when, like, if, like me, if you're laying in the recovery ward and you're like, all that could be gone so fast, you know, it's like, and the world's still gone. And, you know, a little kindness and a little more patience, you know, will go a long way. And you mix that with some humor. You know, just, and I really feel that, um, yeah, that's what I really enjoy about doing, doing the comedy, kind of bring, to bring that. We, we talk uh, more these days about reconciliation uh, since the TRC mm -hmm. report. Uh, and and I, I wonder how you think uh, theater and the arts and having indigenous artists tell their story is helping uh, with that. And, and, and I'm, trying to be careful about asking the question because it shouldn't be on uh, First Nations people to do it. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't want to put it that way, but I just, I wonder what you've observed in your career, Sam, if you've noticed uh, settler communities changing at all through the stories that, that uh, hopefully more Indigenous artists are getting to tell. Mm, yeah, it's, um, I, I, I believe like Kevin, Kevin has accomplished a lot in a, in a very uh, uh, in a very farcical way, he's turned things around in his land, in a land claims farcical play. He's turned things around and opened opening eyes and opening opening up that laughter, opening up to make something that's usually so complex, so above, so so high concept, above anybody's above everybody's pay grade to try and understand what is what land claims are in, in you know nationally you know regionally you know in your neighborhood third party interests etc cetera, etc cetera. you know he's like and it's to break it down and um, make it uh, uh, make make it like a ha like a hands on experience as opposed to a, you know like Look, uh, I met Tom Berger once, and he um, he uh, he is a very accomplished lawyer. You know, he worked for First Nations people. Very young. He actually, he um, one of his first decisions that he won was with my uncle David Bob oh, yeah. in Bob and White versus Crown. Yeah, it was Bob and White first. I think it was seventy one. I think I'm can't quite remember the date, but it was a precedent setting case that Tom Berger did there. And, and he is he's so intelligent, so you know, facile with the the, the legal the the legal uh, angles about studying land claims. Even talking to him, it's just um, yeah. It's and we can't all be there. We can't all be 
we can all have that level of, you know, uh, to talk about land claims, uh, the political and infrastructure and all that. And I think that what, uh, what artists could do is bring components of that and blow it out, make it into something that is, um, you know, in their, in your terms, in their terms, like what, you know, what people understand. And I think that, I think that some of the, um, the, uh, the archetypes that we use to play, are, are, they do that, they, they make it more accessible for, you know, just for regular folks, you know, think, talking, thinking and talking about land claims. Mm -hmm. As, and I really, I'm really enjoying the process myself. So being on stage and doing that. <laughs> well, I know it's a busy weekend, uh, getting ready oh, yeah. last minute, uh, everything, but, but just before we let you go, what do, what do you hope audiences take away from the play once they've seen it? Um, I think, um, well, for me, well, for me, the, you know, truly, I think the arts, what the arts are in Canada is they're a gauge to the health of a nation. Like when you see when you, the stories that, that we see and do across, no matter what the story, the focus of the story is, you know, a gender, class-based, whatever, socioeconomic, and the race, whatever, it, 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 it cuts, it cuts through to something important in, in the in uh, in the national persona, like the, that's what. So good theater, I think it's it's more valuable than than given credit for sometimes, because uh, you know we we need we need it we need that that's um, like I believe that for uh, you know what we do and in, as working in Canada you can I feel it more. And then, you know, like, um, you know, I don't want to be insulting, but, you know, when you see the states getting stuck on that, you know, some really low level kind of, you know, uh, that boo-boo, honey boo-boo and the Kardashian and stuff. And he's like, he's like, why would, you know, it's like, I don't, you know, why, well, why do, why do we do that to ourselves? You know, when you could be, you could be nurturing something. You know, like making making something that nurtures rather than something that's exploitive. It feels exploitive. You know, it's just my opinion, but I know that's what I believe. Sam, it's great to meet you. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing yeah. you on stage, and and thanks for taking the time out uh, again oh, because yeah. we know it's a busy weekend for you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I thank you to Kevin Lauren. Because you make land claims fun. <laughs> Sam Bob is an actor. He's playing yeah. Little Red Warrior in the upcoming Belfry production that starts this week. Little Red Warrior and his lawyer. Of course, if this was uh, in person, I'd remind you that the box office is open. But if you haven't got tickets yet, the box office is online at belfry.bc.ca. A preview this Tuesday, and it's, uh, and it's opening uh, fully uh, after that. So remember, a little red warrior and his lawyer. And, uh, and we'll the... be at, in Vancouver. We'll be in Vancouver in March. Oh, so excellent. We, you know, yeah. Yeah. And we are online. We have online things, too. So scope us out. <laughs> there you go. Uh, look it up. Little Red Warrior and his lawyer, uh, not just here at the Belfry, but uh, beyond and online. And uh, you'll, you'll find more at belfry.bc.ca. And uh, you can search Little Red Warrior and his lawyer. Thanks, everybody, for joining us at Before Play. Thanks again uh, to the Belfry to pivoting yet again during the pandemic and, and doing this online version. And, and I keep thinking, maybe this is the last Zoom call we have to make. Who knows? I won't predict, no. but, but fingers crossed. No. Thank you, Gregor. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin and Sam and Susan. Thank you. And thank you to Maddie for uh, curating this. And thanks, Keith, for uh, all the digital magic. Thank you, everybody.